Welcome back to the show. It's great to be back. It has Thanks been so a much. while since I have seen you. I, the last time you were here on the show was, I guess, maybe three days before the presidential election. Did you see any of this coming? Anything that we're living through right now? <laughs> I kind of did see it coming. Not what we're living through now, but the possibility that Trump could get elected, as I, I write about in the book. Right. But, you know, those times, just think back. It was a time before we were all losing our mind on a daily basis. Those it was were like, good times. it was normal. Right. You know? And now, gee whiz, or Jesus Christ, more accurately. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. I mean, you know, in the, in the book, you, you, you talk about your personal life, and I want to get into that, but, but when you look at the, 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 the White House today, you get these stories coming out all the time of, you know, uh, officials speaking out, saying this is a crazy environment to work in, things are freaking me out. Is that par for the course? Is that what happens <laughs> in a White House? Is it just like a manic environment? Or is this a special time and, and a, a strange White House America's experiencing? This is not normal. <laughs> this is beyond strange. I mean, yes, the White House is an intense place to work. The jobs are tough, blah, blah, blah. Right. But, you know, people aren't crazy. And... <laughs> You, you don't wake up thinking that, oh, my God, tomorrow everything could just literally fall apart. So this, this, it's important for Americans to understand that this is not normal. That's part of what I hope people will get out of this book, is that, you know, there is a way that national security decision-making is supposed to be made. Mm -hmm. There's a way a responsible White House is supposed to work. There's a way policy gets made that is actually supposed to be conducted in the interests of the American people, right. rather than the interests of one man for his own personal, political, or financial gain. We are in totally, we're in the twilight zone. Wow. <laughs> wow. The book, Tough Love, tells your story in a way that I think you've never told it before. You know, many people have seen you in positions of power. Many people have seen you advising President Obama or working on the Clinton side of things. But, but this story is, is, is really personal in a way that I, I don't think I expected. I mean, you, you talk about your parents being divorced and how that affected yourself, your life, your, your, you know, your, your decisions you made growing up. I mean, you, you talk about, for instance, being hungover uh, and then having to brief President Obama and, like, <laughs> you didn't expect this and now you're in the beast, and all of a sudden, it's like, your vacation's cut short. It's like, you're briefing them. Like, why did you choose to share some of those stories, especially the hungover one? <laughs> well, Trevor, I wanted to tell my story in my own words. And I, I felt, you know, while I was in government, particularly after Benghazi, where I was characterized and mischaracterized by both sides, that I couldn't speak for myself because I was still representing the United States. I was still... Interesting. ...speaking on behalf of the president. So when I had the opportunity to tell my own story, I wanted to do it honestly. It's I mean, I think... that you... Yeah, you say that as well, but what I liked, if I may interject, is that you also said... You said, depending on what news people were watching, they either vilified me or they created this idea of me being a hero, and, 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 and you said neither is true. I found that really interesting. Why did you say that? Because neither is true. They're un they were uninformed by who I actually am. I mean, if, to understand me... It's really important to understand my family mm -hmm. and where I came from. And that's why I spend some time in the beginning talking about how I'm the granddaughter of immigrants from Jamaica who came to the United States in 1912 with nothing and went to Portland, Maine, and educated all five of their kids who mm -hmm. went on to be very successful professionals. And how, on the other hand, on my father's side, I'm the daughter of the descendants of slaves and my father who grew up in the, the most, you know, brutal part of... Jim Crow segregation, and then had to fight and serve in World War II at Tuskegee with, as part of the Tuskegee Airmen. And, you know, he couldn't get served off base, but yet German POWs were getting served off base. Wow. So this, this, all of this background informed who I am. And you talked about my parents' divorce. I mean, having to go through that. And as a kid intervening when they were, you know, fighting in a violent fashion to try to you know, calm them down and mm -hmm. protect my little brother and all this stuff. So that all informed who I am. So if I was going to tell my story, the only way to do it was to be honest. And I did, you know, I gave everything that I could in that. Now, talking about being hungover, that wasn't that hard to include. I mean, <laughs> first of all, 
we're all human, right? And this was the, one of the very, it was actually the last night of President Obama's last foreign trip. We were in Lima, Peru, mm -hmm. and you know, Trump had won, you know, we had to execute this transition, and the Obama team knows how to party and knows how to celebrate. <laughs> and we... <laughs> we took over this club in Lima, took over the top floor, drank more Pisco Sours <laughs> per capita than, you know, than most people could do, and then just danced to R&B and hip hop until about three in the morning. That is hilarious. I got back to my room, crashed. I was one of the few people who had to really get up early because I had to be with the president when he started his meetings. Right. I got out of bed and literally my knees buckled. And I thought, okay, this is not about being hungover. This is about having done too many low moves on the dance floor. <laughs> I could barely walk to the shower. By the time I hobbled into the limousine, known as the Beast, to see the president, he asked, as he always does, so, you know, what happened last night? And I said, Mr. President, you missed a hell of a party. <laughs> and none of us are gonna be in top form today. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he, oh. always, he always wished that he could have a little fun, but he had to stay in his hotel room and act presidential. Let me, let me ask you this about that. One thing that I did pick up in the book is there was definitely a personal relationship between President Obama and all of the people who worked for and with him. It's an interesting relationship because there's a respect that seems mutual, and then there is also a level of understanding who's in charge and what needs to be done. I've been particularly interested about what's happening in the Trump White House, you know, when it comes to leaks. You know, regardless of whistleblowers, but just like the leaks. Some people say the leaks are holding Trump back from being a president because a, a White House cannot function effectively if you're leaking every step of what is happening uh, along the way. Do you think the leaks are a good thing? Do you think they're a bad thing? Do you think people should have blind loyalty? How do you think it should work when you're working with a president in the White House? Well, first of all, if you talk to journalists, and I have a number of friends who cover the White House, they'll tell you that Trump's the leaker in chief. He's the one putting out a lot of this stuff. And then you've got, you know... So eight... he leaks to journalists, just yes. to confirm. So he, he's the... Yeah, so he when they go a source big... in the White House, he is a... they're talking about him. He is... Re... <laughs> yeah. He is reputedly the source of a lot of leaks. Now, I'm... there are others. I'm not su suggesting right, right, they're right. not. Right, right, right. But what's also so depressing about the Trump White House is somebody who's worked in a White House. These are hard jobs. And yet... Everybody there is stabbing everybody else in the back. Nobody can trust the guy in the office or the woman down the hall not to be screwing them to the press. And that there's this sort of sense of, you know, everybody trying to destroy everybody else. Mm -hmm. And Trump being the one that you, you don't know if you're going to come into work one day and, you know, halfway through the day, he tweets that you're gone. Wow. So think about that. Uh, so, look, I don't like leaks. I think leaks are a bad thing. And when I was national security advisor, you know, I got really pissed if people were leaking stuff. And they right. didn't do much because we had a tight ship and we were loyal to each other and we had each other's backs. And that made those tough jobs much, much more tolerable and often a whole lot of fun. The, the Ukraine call is an interesting one because part of the argument coming from the Democrats has been it was particularly suspicious because Donald Trump and his team placed this call on a code word server, a more secure server that isn't regularly used for calls, regular calls that don't have um, sensitive information. But the Trump team has said, yes, it's not regularly done, but we get leaked on so much that we have to find a different way to keep this information away from people. So is there merit to that argument? No, let me explain why. First of all, the regular... National Security Council computer system is highly classified, up to top secret level and beyond. That's the regular That's one. That's the regular Got one. Got it. So this one we're talking about is super, super duper secret. Got it. Okay? <laughs> uh, that's a technical term. Yes, I'm with you. <laughs> so um, there are two ways to manage it. You put it on the regular server and mm -hmm. you can still limit distribution. I see. You know, it, you don't have to hide it on a super secret server to limit distribution. That's, you know, th normally the people who get a copy of the transcript are the people who have a reason 
to know what happened on the call. Mm -hmm. So that's a limited circle in the first place. But I think the Trump people made a mistake, frankly, at the very beginning of the administration, where they didn't know how the system worked. And they, I think, blasted call transcripts across the entire national So they just, like, hit account. reply all with it's every call. Right. That's what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. And they, they got burnt. But they didn't need to go to that extreme to solve right, that problem. Right, right, right. Let me ask you this. If you were, and I know this is a crazy question. Don't even go there. I know where you're going. <laughs> Come on, man. If you, if you were, if you were advising in this White House, not about the politics of, like, you know, the, the, not, not the Trump side of things, but let's talk about, like, for instance, Syria. If you were advising in and around Syria okay. and the military decisions that are being made right now, Donald Trump has been blasted from all sides. Right? Republicans have come out Rightly like we've never so. seen them before. Democrats have come out. The Kurdish forces have come out. People have all said, Donald Trump, what have you done? Except Putin, Assad, and Turkey. Funny that, eh? Right. <laughs> so... Do you think that he betrayed the Kurdish forces if his argument is, I didn't have a deal, that was another deal from a different president. I didn't have a deal with the Kurdish forces? Okay, wait a minute. First because, of all, because Trump it's and his not people... about I. The whole problem with Trump is it's all about I. It's not an America first foreign policy. It's a me first foreign policy. The United <laughs> States... <laughs> the United States of America had an understanding with the Kurds, which he has honored for two and a half years. And it, yes, it began under President Obama. We worked with the Kurds. They did the fighting in effect for us to take out ISIS. Now we have turned around because Donald Trump woke up on the wrong side of the bed or President Erdogan of Turkey promised him something, and I'm actually really curious to know what it was, in order for him to sell these guys out without consulting anybody on his national security team. And what is going to happen now is not only will we have broken our word and left these people vulnerable to Turkish invasion, and these Turks want to kill the Kurds. I mean, it's that simple. Uh, but also, there are some 10,000-plus ISIS fighters, terrorists, who are, the Kurds have been holding in detention. As prisoners, yes. And now they have to go defend themselves without the United States against the Turks. Do you think they're going to be paying attention to those prisoners? Or do you think maybe they're a little bit pissed and they just might lose the key? That's 10,000 or more hardcore terrorists who have the United States and Europe in their crosshairs, that Donald Trump has just let go. For what? That's why everybody's so pissed. This is serious as a heart attack. Wow. When you look at Trump, then, <laughs> if you have to... It's really... And... <laughs> it's not my problem. And, and he says... And he says, listen, I think America was in too many wars. I don't want to fight with Iran. I don't want to be fighting in Syria. I don't want to be fighting anywhere in the... We fight too many wars. That's what Donald Trump says. Do you think that there is merit to that? Or do you think America is just damned to be the police of the world? Well, here's where Trump is misleading the American people. We've learned in the Obama administration that there's more than one way to fight terrorists. We don't have to deploy large numbers of American ground forces, as we did in Iraq mm -hmm. on, uh, in the Bush administration, to deal with a terrorist threat, or in that case, Saddam, followed by a terrorist threat. We can work, as the military would say, by, with, and through partners. These Kurds were our partners. They were doing the fighting. We were doing the advising and the logistical support and the air cover. It was a very economical and effective way to do it. We're talking about hundreds of troops, not thousands of troops. But those hundreds were key to giving the Kurds confidence that we remain with them and to keeping an eye on ISIS and on those prisoners. So this was not a case where the president could say, I'm bringing thousands of American troops home. Mm -hmm. No. He left our partners hanging. He put America at much greater risk because these prisoners are going to either leave and come and get us or our partners, or they're going to reconstitute on the ground and continue to, to be a presence that we thought we had put in the box. Let me ask you this before I let you go. We got to end on a much more optimistic note. <laughs> let me ask you this. Writing a book is a really interesting process because you almost relive your life from the beginning 
to the day that you put the pen down. When you looked back on everything that you've done, everything that you've achieved, everything that you were part of, is there anything you wish you could have done differently? <laughs> Many. <laughs> one thing that you wish you had done differently in your role in government. What is one thing where you go like, man, I, that thing, I, I wish I could have done that better or differently, or I, I, would have, I would have tweaked the way I saw the world. What would it have been? Well, I write in this book about how my mother warned me not to go on the Sunday shows in 2012 when I went on to talk about Benghazi. Interesting. And she perceived what I didn't, which is that, you know, I was thinking about, I've been, I'm on the team, the team has asked me to do it, I wasn't, that wasn't my plan, blah, blah, blah. I was gonna take my kids to the Ohio State football game mm -hmm. that weekend, and I actually did because I made a promise and I wanted to keep it. But I came back and agreed to do the Sunday shows because Secretary Clinton uh, apparently had, was exhausted and didn't feel uh, that she wanted to do it. And my mother tried to convince me. She literally said, I smell a rat, you shouldn't do this. And the rat was not that somebody was setting me up. Her perception was that when you're in a crisis and you're one, the first person to go out and share that information, that information is inevitably gonna change and the messenger uh, will be assailed, not right. just the message. And she was right. And uh, I think maybe others uh, of my colleagues perceived that better than I did too. Wow. But so the lesson, everybody, is listen to your mother. <laughs> and, Whether you're in government or at home, and, listen to your mother. Thank and that's you so what much. I tell my kids. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming Thank back you to so the show. Much. Tough Love is available now. And that's what she's in life, everybody.